get started now. All right. Good evening. Good morning. Good night. Good day, <laughs> wherever you are. That's a good thing with global courses. You could you could give all kinds of greetings. Yes, yes, indeed. All right. So we stopped at around slide 43, 44 last day. And uh, what I remember is talking about activations and triggers as the last thing. And then we were supposed to go into a little bit about coordination centers. But before we push on into this very intense, um, voluminous information, any questions from the last session? Anything you need clarification on? I see a raised hand, Shani. Um, let's see if we can unmute this person. Okay, you're on, go ahead. Hi, my name is Shani. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Minnesota. Okay. And you have a question? No, I was letting you know I was in the group. I was speaking to you guys. Okay, that's fine. Welcome. We welcome you. Thank you very much. All right, Dr. Damien, let's proceed. All right, so. <laughs> Okay, so to manage any disaster, we need to do it from a coordination center, all right? Now, disasters are of such a nature that we don't, we don't rely on one constructed location, all right? Or while it's intact, we work from there. However, the center serves to bring together organizations to ensure effective disaster management. And as long as the shelter stands before, during, and after the event, this is where everybody and all resources are gonna meet. The primary functions of a disaster coordination center, they revolve around three key activities, forward planning, resource management, and information management. All right, now the forward planning, how are we gonna to respond to different areas, to, to the news that is coming in, um, how are we gonna plan? It's easier to do it from one location. And we have centralized planning. Resource management, while we may know there's multiple areas hit, if all the resources that people are sending come to one location, it's easier to account for it and then redistribute out to where it's needed. Likewise, with information management, if we send rescue teams out, we send infrastructure teams out, we send damage assessment teams out, they know where to come back to report. Out in the field, they may not have a radio or cellular network, but they know where to come back to report so we can manage the information that we receive from the field. Also, we can issue information from this location. So the Disaster Coordination Center is an important place to identify before the disaster occurs. And some other functions of a Disaster Coordination Center include <clears throat> the, the operational decision-making, of the disaster coordinator, where we could, it serves as a functional location where we could request more resources. All right, and it's the source where we could push information from. It's also, it, um, even though we don't encourage the media to come swarming our disaster coordination center, it is where the politicians or those that are designated to give reassurance or update the public 
it's where they could make their statements and um, they do their media briefing from. All right, so if you're at the disaster coordination center, it's where you will activate the center in line with your pre-planned processes and procedures. And of course, it having a, a location, uh, if you want to call it an office, it's not really an office when you're in a disaster mode, but having a base is makes it so much easier for you to record data and file it. Now, all disaster management groups are important when we have to notify and disseminate information to the members of the respective groups and to the wider community. In each country, there will be a different agency responsible for issuing official warnings, and that depends on the hazards. For example, in Australia, there's FES, Fire and Emergency Service. In Trinidad, we have the TTFS, and they're similarly responsible for issuing fire warnings like bushfires. In Trinidad, our meteorological office. In the US, it's uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, that issues all weather uh, warnings like cyclones, uh, also known as hurricanes snowstorms, blizzards, flood warnings, etc. The Center for Disease Control and in Trinidad, the Ministry of Health is responsible for issuing warnings about public health and pandemic issues. So these agencies are also to ensure that the warnings are provided to other response agencies, not just the general public, but they formally communicate to several other agencies in Trinidad, including the Office of the Prime Minister and the Office of uh, the Ministry of National Security. All right. When we talk about local communications, some groups may consider resource requirements that are outside of the activation and disaster events. In Trinidad, where we have an influx of 16,000 plus Venezuelans, we have to have interpreter services more so now. Um, of course, there are also community engagement experts, right? Um, the documentation, that has to be communicated across your local area. So of course we know that any country that has forward and effective planning would have had uh, written plans already. And we, we talked a lot about the written plans at these several levels from uh, the state level to the local disaster management group level and the interconnectivity and intercommunication among the different plans. There are the standard emergency warning systems across uh, a lot of, of territories that is essentially an alert signal. In Trinidad, there was a pilot of an SMS system with the cellular uh, carriers, all right? So in event of a national emergency, there's a broadcast SMS that could be issued. It is still in effect in Trinidad and based on emergency situations that are happening, all Trinidadian cellular phones can receive a, a text, an SMS, if issued from the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management, the ODPM. Now, the prime minister, by law, is not allowed to issue any political broadcast on that network, which is a good thing. However, the office of the ODPM, the Disaster Preparedness and Management Office, they are the ones who have the authority to use that channel to alert the public. 
All right. Uh, we've probably all seen movies where you hear the air raid sirens. All right. Um, they don't really exist in many Caribbean countries. I think that's an American thing in the cities. But we don't have those in the Caribbean. We do have a tsunami warning system. And the tsunamis, uh, that warning system is tied into the SMS system. All right. So if we do have a seismic activity, like what is happening right now as we speak in St. Vincent, Anybody here from St. Vincent? Well, we do have a situation in St. Vincent where there were a couple of small eruptions on the volcano, the La Soufre volcano today, and it's being closely monitored. The residents, the citizens of St. Vincent, 120,000 odd of them, have been put on alert that the volcano is active. And there are a couple of places that they have effected mandatory evacuation. And they're also scaling up for widespread evacuation of the island based on what they're seeing. The seismologists have indicated that, that there is the 30% possibility of a huge pyroclastic eruption a big volcanic eruption, right? So there's a three tenths chance that that would happen. And there's continuous monitoring of that volcano right, right now. And St. Vincent is about 150 miles from Trinidad, our North coast. Okay, so they're not far away at all. Um, so that makes them about 220 miles away from where I live. So if there's a major volcanic eruption, we're gonna feel the rumblings right across here in Trinidad. All right, so we are monitoring that situation closely right now. Now I did mention the media before, media management is very important because the media sensationalize a lot of things and it's quite possible for some irresponsible journalist to add a few flashy words and end up causing hysteria. So media must be managed and you, essentially you will have to have some training. If you have to issue a statement to the media, use short sentences. That's about the simplest way I could tell you, use short sentences. Now we had started talking about evacuation. Evacuation and sheltering, these are two strategies. They are hazard mitigation strategies and risk reduction. The idea is to lessen the effects of a disaster on a community. So in the case of a volcano, shelter is not going to be an option because I don't think they have invented a volcano proof house yet. <laughs> so bearing that in mind, no matter how you build your house with current technology, in the face of volcanic lava flow, it's not gonna survive. And if you're sheltering inside of it, you're not gonna survive. So depending on the hazard, evacuation may be the preferred strategy. Now, a different case, if there is a hurricane coming, the hurricane is a couple hundred miles wide and a couple miles high. It will be difficult for you to get a flight or a boat ride out of where you live in time. So in that case, there has to be sheltering arrangements and your shelter would have to be chosen beforehand, all right? And based on a few relevant factors. Example, is the shelter gonna withstand a category four at least 
hurricane? Is it out of a flood plain? You know, will I not be flooded out if I go there to shelter? And a couple of other very relevant questions about the shelter itself. Okay. Self-evacuation is the self-initiated movement of people to safer places before or in the absence of official advice or warnings to evacuate. All right. We've seen so many movies about it where people choose to leave early because in the absence of the hazard, but based on a forecast. Safe places may include sheltering with family or friends who may live in safer building locations. And you have to manage your own withdrawal. You have to face the traffic and make your own transportation arrangements. All right. People are encouraged to evacuate early if they intend to evacuate to help avoid some of the congestion on the roads. Then there's voluntary evacuation, all right, where it's recommended after advice has been issued. All right, and people start affecting their own. So in an evacuation, there's essentially five stages. First, you decide to evacuate, all right, and you analyze event intelligence and assess the necessity to evacuate people based on the range of hazards. And then you have a warning where the event conditions required are conveyed to the public the withdrawal phase is where people are actually physically moved from a dangerous or potentially dangerous area to a safer location. And that safer location is where they will shelter, all right, and have their basic needs hopefully met. And subsequent to that, when the disaster, the disaster has passed, it's where we assess the damage area and then plan for staged returns of evacuees because we don't want a mass flood rushing back into the areas, especially when there's been damage to infrastructure. Now, experience indicates that mass evacuation causes anxiety and stress. It leads to panic, it leads to looting, it leads to loss of life. So, it is highly recommended that evacuation plans be developed based on credible worst case scenarios, taking into consideration how big the event could be, the scale, through immediate planning. A well-planned evacuation, well communicated before the occurrence of the events will serve to minimize risk to both the community as well as to the management personnel. Evacuation facilities and safer locations, you know, they're, they're many and vary, but these have to be planned for, in some cases, built and supplied before the event so that you could tell people where they need to go. So we're moving on now to logistics. All right before the event, during the event, and after the event. This is where if you're a little bit OCD, your skills would be needed because some of the best logistics managers are those who have a stickler for detail, okay? So the functions of log logistics during the disaster is detailed organization, provision, movement, and management of resources required in the disaster operations. The right thing at the right place at the right time. It's a lot of detail to manage. And to be honest, it is not my personal strongest point, but I do have a couple of professionals who I work with who are extremely good at logistics. It's like they have an almost photographic memory and they remember well, this needs that, 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 that. It's amazing to see them work sometimes. Disaster management groups are strongly encouraged to plan your logistics. Even if you don't have all that amount of acumen for logistics, you can plan before. And the more you read your plan, the more you would find holes in your own plan and you could improve it. All right? Because you want to deliver appropriate supplies 
within a disaster affected area in good condition in the quantities required at the places and times where they are needed. To do so doesn't happen by chance. It takes a lot of skill and preparation. Some things that are managed under logistics are requests for assistance and offers of assistance, emergency supply, council to council arrangements, resupply operations. Now what's the difference? The emergency supplies would be going to the victims. Resupply operations go to both responders and victims. All right? So when planning logistics, some of the main things to consider is the risk assessment of the hazard exposure. All right, the capacity and capability necessary to manage and coordinate the delivery of the appropriate supplies and documentation of processes, roles, and responsibilities in the logistics subplan. Now, when we normally run the disaster management course, we take an entire day just going through all the logistical aspects because it is where the whole disaster relief effort could crumble if you don't have proper systems to manage your logistics, all right? So you have to make sub-plan arrangements for your emergency supplies, where it's going to come from, what it's going to be comprised of, where it's going to be stored, how it's going to be stored, how it's going to be transported, and then finally, to whom and in what quantities. Also in that, you have to consider waste management and a simple thing like drinking water. All right? Resupply. Isolated communities. You could reach them early and deliver some supplies, but it's going to be used up. So until normal, uh, normal situation can be resolved, they will have to have resupplies. And this has to be planned for in terms of the frequency. And you have to stock up for this so that you're able to pull from your stock and distribute. All right, so you need to have efficient foods, medicines, water, stockpiles, fuel, you know, it's like packing up a grocery store, just not with so many frivolous items. All right. The long term aim would be to increase resilience. And then you have to manage offers of resistance and requests for assistance. All right. So to coordinate, support, and facilitate requests, booking of travel and accommodation for volunteers. If you need uh, volunteer responders with certain skills, when they get to ground zero, ground zero is the term for your disaster point, they go to the disaster coordination center after they've worked all day and performed for you. When they come back, where will they sleep? All this has to be planned for. Now, some things that hamper resupply operations would be the size and geographic diversity of countries, distribution of communities, and nature of potential hazards. For example, the island of Dominica. Dominica, not Dominican Republic, a tiny island called Dominica, was hit by a Category 4 hurricane a couple of years ago. The entire island is very mountainous. And there are some small communities that were totally isolated by floods and landslides and rock slides. And as a result, getting supplies to them was very difficult. Uh, the government of Trinidad and Tobago sent a couple of helicopters, one rescue helicopter and one supply helicopter. And that did in fact save a lot of people's lives uh, in the relief effort.
Now you can resupply isolated communities. Essentially they're isolated until the road or the bridge or the uh, railroad could be repaired or made possible and that ends their isolation. Then there may be isolated rural property, all right? One single property that, you know, the family is marooned or uh, they need supplies, they can't come out, you know? And then you could resupply a stranded person. A person has been identified, they find themselves in a predicament. They need uh, uh, some assistance until rescuers can get to them. All right, now the rescuers is not going to reach to them to sit with them. When you have the rescuer reaching them, it's to extract them. Now the public in country and in some occasions overseas, generously offer assistance to affected individuals and communities by financial donations, volunteers, and goods and services. A statement just issued by uh, the Trinidad and Tobago government. Okay, pardon me here. Uh, Caribbean, 5.45 p.m., that's less than an hour ago. Conditions at La Soufre deteriorate Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez issues evacuation order effective immediately to the red zone, alert level elevated to red zone. All areas north Union to Kingstown on the windward side of the island and from Barul Ali on the leeward side and the Grenadine Islands. They have just been issued the evacuation order. So they have to leave the island and go to somewhere safer. Well, at least they have to leave their communities for now. All right, so this is happening as we speak, breaking news. All right, just reading that off WhatsApp quickly. Um, what I was looking for is Oh, I know where that is. Right, media release from Trinidad and Tobago, 8th of April, 2021. Trinidad and Tobago stands ready to assist St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It doesn't say how. The mobilization of our chief of defense staff has mobilized members of Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force to be on standby and provide any assistance to the people of the Republic of St. Vincent and the Grenadines as may be necessary. The Coast Guard of Trinidad and Tobago has canceled all leaves for servicemen. Uh, we continue to monitor the situation and stay in touch with the authorities in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So as we are doing this training, an event is unfolding less than 200 miles away from me. All right. So pretty soon, I'm, I'll probably get a call. About 75% sure I'll get a call before the night is out. Oh, that means I'll have to shave. Really? All right, so say again. Really? Yeah, to wear the SCBAs and stuff. When you're when you dealing with volcanoes, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. you have to take your own air because the stuff that comes out of a volcano is deadly. Yeah, understood. Right, so I have to fire up the shears. <laughs> all right, so we're talking about offers of assistance. All right, so you see, as soon as the evacuation order was given, Trinidad and Tobago responded that we are here, we are ready, we're going to mobilize some of our servicemen and a couple of our Coast Guard vessels to come to your aid. Um, I'm sure they will be working out what the plans are. Um, 
and what they're going to be doing. And as they need more resources, such as my company, they're going to call us and, you know, let us know what they need. Okay, so offers of assistance are, of course, financial donations. These are normally the easiest to, to use, but because it's so easy, it's the stuff that's stolen fastest, if not accounted for properly. So in Trinidad, anytime there's a relief effort for uh, any, for assisting any Caribbean country that was a uh, victim to any disaster, there's normally one entity that everybody, Bye. There's Bye. normally one entity that would be identified and the public would be alerted that all donations can be made to XYZ organization. And they'll give you one account that you can make financial donations to that account. All right, so that the bank tracks it and everything. Volunteers. Right, such as myself and most of the people that work for me. We are individuals organized in a group and we could offer disaster affected communities some help if needed. Now, there are also goods and services that could be solicited or unsolicited offered by members of the public, communities, businesses, organizations, and corporate entities that support individuals and communities following disaster events. So if you're forced to leave your home because of a disaster event, what's one of the things that you're gonna need? Something to eat. You're also gonna need somewhere to sleep. You're also gonna need toilet facilities sooner or later. All right? So in the logistics that we just mentioned, all those things have to be planned for and provisioned. All right, so we also, in, in the, the higher level training, we also focus a bit, uh, it's about an hour and a half on the accounting side. All right, so we give you some good training on how to account for the donations and how to identify if someone is trying to launder some uh, funny money by bringing counterfeit money to the donation center and donating in cash. The deterrent for that is to have everybody donate to an account, right? But like we mentioned, if you're gonna be coordinating a disaster, you would want someone in the bank to keep you abreast of what's happening with the account as people are donating, all right? Now, depend on the scale of the disaster, the bank may not open or may not be able to open. So beforehand, your local disaster management group has to coordinate with a, the bank or the banker, maybe somebody from your neighborhood who works at the bank. These conversations and plans have to be had and put in place before the event. Now, people involved in community mobilization require clear communication about the disaster event, all right, and support services. There are trained volunteers, for example, the police, the fire service, the armed forces, and companies like mine. We are trained volunteers, okay? Some of us do it for our living. About half of my staff will be called out by fire and rescue, all right? And the rest of them that um, they work in industry, they are available also for call out, but they all have essentially the same training, all right? Then there's also the Salvation Army who, um, you know, unless you, you've been involved with the Salvation Army, the average Joe doesn't know how much training the members of the Salvation Army have in logistics and resource coordination. 
All right. A uh, couple of other um, organizations are Rotarians, the Rotary Club. And um, what's the other one that's similar to them? Rotary Club and I forget, but some of these are charitable clubs. They are very, very good at mobilizing resources. And then there are spontaneous volunteers, people who are not skilled or trained, but they want to help. And they may not be affiliated with an emergency or community organization, but they are motivated to help. All right, so these people, you when they come to you at your disaster coordination center, you don't want to turn them away, but you don't want to have them in your way and chewing up your resources. So you have to plan for what they can do and how you could use them. <clears throat> now, volunteers are the responsibility of the organization for, from which they volunteer and not you in the disaster coordination center. So if there's a bunch of uh, young people that come, speak to their leader and give the functions to the leader. Mutual aid agreements. These address issues as access across boundaries. For example, there is a mutual aid agreement between the US and Canada. All right, there, there used to be one between Dominican Republic and Haiti. There is one in the island of St. Martin on the Dutch side and the French side. All right. And a mutual aid assistance agreement is being formulated right now between the Cooperative Republic of Guyana and the People's Republic of Suriname. All right, I know for a fact that that is being done right now because they asked my advice on some of the salient points in it. Now, mutual aid and assistance agreement is a legal document. All right, it has to go through the scrutiny of lawyers and provides a means for a jurisdiction to provide resources, facilities, services, and other required support to another jurisdiction during an event. So Guyana and Suriname have a flurry of oil and gas activity right now. In case there is a severe oil spill, they have an agreement in place where they will aid each other to battle the spill and contain it and sort out the money afterwards. All right? So the mutual aid agreement, mutual aid and assistance agreement addresses issues like provision of resources and services, public safety, who will declare that the state of emergency exists, who will be in charge of resources received, who will provide compensation and debt benefits for those injured or killed while rendering aid. And that's an important thing. Corporate donations, the main thing with corporate donations is accounting for it, okay? Um, so that respect, your local disaster management group would need to avail itself of some legal expertise, right? To find out if there is an integrity act and how it's going to affect you in receiving corporate donations to your community in event of post-disaster. All right, the need for recovery. This happens after several disasters, several types of disasters. Disaster, sorry. Recovery aims to provide the opportunity to rebuild a stronger and more resilient community. So if you suffered a flood event and it washed away your bridge and left some people marooned, when you're rebuilding, you may want to consider a wider and deeper river channel that will handle a larger volume, a wider span bridge, and possibly a higher bridge that's better constructed to handle a bigger flood event. 
And in the Caribbean, we have often seen where a bridge washed out and they, build, they rebuilt the exact same size bridge for some mind boggling reason or other. All right. Planning for recovery is integral to preparing for emergencies. It's not just a post disaster consideration. The recovery process begins during the response to an event and it may continue long term. All right. Recovery requires collaboration between all levels of disaster management arrangements, businesses, NGOs, and of course the community. Now in your planning and in familiarizing participants with your plans, policies, agreements, and procedures, et cetera, a number of discussion-based exercises can help you with disseminating information and engage with people who want to volunteer, also to engage with those people who represent the agencies that you need to interact in. Seminars are informal discussions designed to orient participants to new and updated plans, policies, or procedures. So the city of San Fernando has an annual disaster management seminar in disaster planning week, which is normally towards the end of April. They also have workshops. A workshop is, a workup, workshop is similar to a seminar, but it's employed to build specific products like a draft plan or a policy. All right, so you may have an evacuation workshop or a disaster coordination center workshop or a training and exercise planning workshop etc. Then we have tabletop exercises. This involves key personnel discussing simulated scenarios. So we identify a couple of scenarios and then we sit and discuss the yay or nay, what will work, what can't work, what are the possible problems. And you have more than one person taking extensive notes or sometimes even video recording the entire thing. Right? A tabletop exercise attempts to approximate reality and the focus is on training and familiarization with roles, responsibilities, procedures, personalities in the jurisdiction's emergency management system. All right, the tabletop exercise can be used to assess the plans, assess the policies and assess the procedures. So you determine is it suitable is it sufficient and does it make sense? Now, when we're talking about disaster level events, it's difficult to plan a drill. So the tabletop exercises have to normally take the place. Games are a simulation of operations that involve two or more teams, usually in a competitive environment. And games are normally used to train um, and uh, engage the specific agencies such as search and rescue, police, fire services, ambulance services. Now you have some operations-based exercises, such as a drill. A drill aims to validate your plans, policies, and agreements. All right, and it's a supervised activity, usually employed to test a single specific operation or function within a single entity, okay? So you may have a fire drill, which will test not only the community knowledge and response to a fire, but it will also test the fire services ability and capacity to respond or a missing persons drill where you coordinate between the police and the rescue services and the medical uh, service providers, right? And the aim is to locate, rescue, or retrieve and process uh, someone who is missing. 
Now there is also something called functional exercises that examine and or validate the command the control between the agency coordination centers. And then some countries have luxury or the necessity to run a full scale exercise. Anytime there is a full scale exercise, all right, you have multi agency, multi jurisdictional, multi discipline exercises. For example, uh, the oil company in Trinidad and Tobago is now called Heritage Petroleum. And they have just entered their third year of existence. And it was announced this month that they are planning a major full scale oil spill exercise. So it's gonna utilize marine resources, not only from the company, um, but also the Coast Guard, uh, shipping agencies, ports, uh, ambulance services, police, fire services, uh, the fishermen organizations, you know, so the planning has just begun and they aim to execute this drill in August. All right. At the airport, airports are famous for performing full scale exercises. All right, and it's actually a civil aviation requirement that airports demonstrate their capability to handle emergencies dealing with not just one, but with multiple emergency situations occurring to aircraft, right? And one of the reasons why it's so important for airports to do that is because they have a lot of people coming through them and also if you know anything about metals <laughs> aluminium burns at a lower heat it melts fast and it could actually catch fire itself all right so dealing quickly with aircraft emergencies is important All right, are there any questions while I load up the next slide? All right, if anybody have any questions, please just uh, show by the raise of hands and then Dr. Damien would be able to respond to that. If not, uh, please continue, Dr. Damien. Yeah, just give me a couple of seconds. Let me load up this next slide deck. Right, found it. Uh, Damien, I think Sean Alexander had a question. Sure, he can go ahead.
John, go ahead. You had a question. Yes. Good evening. Um, very good, good lecture. Um, Thank you. Enjoying it so far. Um, and thanks for the information about Trinity, uh, about um, St. Vincent. I am from St. Lucia. And as you know, St. Lucia is just about 27 miles across from St. Vincent, um, the south of St. Lucia, um, Viewfort, where the international airport is located, is just about 27 miles from St. Vincent. Oh, so you see in the smoke? Um, well, I'm not down, I am not down in the south, I live in the north. Oh, however, um, I managed I managed two police two police um, station um, two police in district on that side of the island um, closer okay. to the south. Um, we just mm -hmm. had discussion as to if if um, the volcano actually erupt and um, ashes and whatnot, it probably would affect the some of the districts on that side of the island. So we were already planning. Where the station will probably have to move to the personnel of the decision moved and the schools, the schools will have to be located, relocated the class classes because classes would start on the 19th. Um, relocated. So they were looking at other schools already to relocate um, classrooms. We also, I think, engage St. Vincent education system where they can take students in to St. Lucia to continue their education whilst that is happening. Um, mm -hmm. So thanks for that information. So we're actually planning here already for the worst and then to assist St. Vincent um, in the event that um, it actually, the volcano actually erupt. Yes, Sean. So you can also check Sidera website, C-D-E-R-A yeah. and Sidema. Yeah. yeah. All right. You will get updates on their websites okay, as, the, uh, yeah. as the thing unfolds. Okay, and I think um, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, and a few other islands, the disaster, um, the, 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 the organization that manages disaster in the island is called NEMO, National Emergency Nemo. Management Organization. Right. Yeah, so, so the lecture has just come timely, you know, to, um, it's just timely right now with what's happening so close to home. That's true. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sean. Uh, Dr. Damien, uh, Chief Oakney had uh -huh. a question. Um, I'm just going to unmute him. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chief. <laughs> greetings. Greetings, uh, uh, Damien. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Kiwi. Thank you so much. Um, the question that one here has is regarding the area of security in a disaster uh, situation. Um, uh -huh. When those things are happening, um, or if there is an incident command, I know there are different levels to the, um, uh, it depends on where one comes in, I guess, perhaps in the situation that is going on. Uh, when it comes to security and particularly regarding the resources of the uh, materials and so forth, um, the equipment that needs to be used in those situations, uh, do you all uh, set up separate agreements uh, with the po police or with the military in those particular situations? Or is it very, um, I guess, or would it be case by case scenario, depending on what the uh, sources, uh, what resources are available in that particular country or area? You, you're right on two things. Um, so I could tell you from my company, whenever we respond, we already have a schedule where somebody stands security because it's a lot of equipment that we'll mobilize. It's expensive, right? But it's stuff that we need to use to save lives. Oftentimes at the disaster coordination center, there's building security. So as you're entering disaster coordination centers are often fenced locations. So there's control security. Sometimes at your tactical uh, temporary command post, you may have to establish a security perimeter and post three or four guards. And what I found on occasion is that some of those unattached volunteers serve great for that. You see a bunch of four or five guys, they come, they want to help, you know, the situation. Hey guys, I got a serious situation. I need security. I don't want any and anybody 
you know, just showing up at my site. This is my entrance. You direct everybody through here, right? So a couple of you station there, you station here, you station here, all right? And then you assign somebody, you can do it on the spot. You assign somebody that you go around every two hours and make sure these guys get water and food, but they're the security detail. It can be done like that. I had to do it like that in Honduras. All right. We had to do it like that also in Bahamas. Mm. So wow. there, there's opportunity for resources to be stolen. And part of the logistics, and, and as you respond to more and more disasters, you learn more and more. Um, and then as you volunteer for more and more training, As you volunteer for more and more training, you learn more and more, especially from practitioners. Some of the best training nuggets I've had is from the chats after the formal class. When you hear from people exactly what they had to do in the response effort, you know, but on your question of security, it's not going to always be there. And it's one of those things that you have to plan for. Answer your question? Very much so. Thank you. All right, Dr. Damien, thank you. You may proceed. All right. So we're pushing on with the second slide deck. All right. And we're going to be talking about response arrangements. All right. We touched on this before. Taking appropriate measures to respond to an event, including action taken and measures planned in anticipation of during and immediately after an event to ensure that its effects are minimized and that persons affected by the event are given immediate relief and support. Okay, so disaster operations and disaster recovery are key components. The, the response and the recovery are key components of the operation. All right, so this little diagram here gives you the, the timeline. All right, the disaster response essentially is where local governments are primarily responsible for responding to the disaster event in the district and state level, providing appropriate resorts, uh, resources and support. And the recovery may arise from a range of disaster events, including natural and non natural. Okay, and we see that in this uh, diagram here in a nutshell. So triggering a response arrangement. Activation of response arrangement occurs when there is need to monitor potential hazards or disaster operations. So if there is a hurricane watch issued, the ODPM, starts calling up its volunteers, putting shelter managers, putting disaster coordination center managers and teams on notification that they may be needed. So this starts from 48 hours before the impact of the hurricane. And where support or coordinate disaster operations being conducted by a designated lead agency um, since they are rotational, and once we know that we have more than a 50% chance of being hit by a hurricane, then the ODPM in Trinidad goes ahead and names a national coordinator, right? And that will be the focal person who will manage the entire, uh, response and recovery operation post hurricane. The guy or the lady's job starts before the hurricane comes where they're coordinating with the meteorological office to issue uh, evacuation warnings in low lying areas to different communities, letting them know you're at the risk of floods 
and you need to move now. Okay? Now, in support of disaster and recovery operations, there's going to need uh, response arrangements. Activation does not necessarily mean disaster management groups have to be convened, but we will provide information to members of those groups about the risks associated with a pending hazard impact. Okay? Because in the face of a hurricane, you would want to secure your family first. And after your family is provisioned and secured, then you could respond to help those who are affected. Okay? So the decision to activate disaster management arrangements, including disaster management groups or coordination centers, depend on a lot of things, including the perceived level of impact to the community. And when you have to activate the response arrangements, this will occur in accordance with the processes detailed in the plan. Okay, I was watching um, a Winnie the Pooh movie uh, with my kids and even Pooh Bear and Rabbit were making plans. It was Piglet's big movie. Don't interfere with the plan. All right, so if kids know how to make a plan, why don't you have one? Right, uh, so in the activation, you could activate local response, district response, state response, and national response. All right, hazard specific activations, where a disaster event requires the activation of hazard specific arrangements, for example, for fire or in the case of St. Vincent, I don't think there's anything more specific than a volcano. How could you mistake anything else for a volcano? All right. That is a hazard specific activation. And, you know, in some, in some regards, you're fortunate that while you're a participant in this course, you heard the activation of a countrywide. Uh, arrangement, all right? Specific hazard activation to volcano. Evacuation authority was given. So disaster coordination centers also, they have effective management and they require strong coordination. So in the case of St. Vincent, since Christmas, uh, they knew that the volcano became active. I've been to St. Vincent about eight times, and at no time did I ever see any kind of activity in the crater. I've actually had the opportunity twice to fly completely over the Souffre and look down into the caldera, and it was quite a sight to behold. So in all those times, I have never seen any indication that that beautiful mountain would go live. All right. Now, since Christmas, I am pretty sure the government of St. Vincent has massaged their plans based on the possibility that the entire country may have to evacuate. Similarly to what happened to Montserrat a few years ago. All right. So it happened a few years ago um, in Montserrat where the entire island was evacuated. And then after the volcano died down, uh, there was a phased repatriation. All right. So it's quite possible that we'll see that same thing happening in St. Vincent. We talked about the coordination centers. Who declares a disaster situation? In the case of St. Vincent, the prime minister himself gave the order 
that evacuation must occur in certain areas, right? And he gave that at 5.45 just an hour and a half ago. Right, the laws of the country would give the legislative authority for de declaring a disaster situation, notice of declaration, duration, extension, and ending the disaster situation. The declaration of a disaster situation provides additional powers to nominated officers. For example, some of the armed forces personnel in St. Vincent will have additional duties and powers. Okay, so this declaration of a disaster situation is to exercise those additional powers to prevent or minimize loss of human life, prevent or minimize illness or injury to humans, property loss or damage, or in the case of a, of a volcano, depends on where the lava flows, you're gonna have property loss and damage, all right? And damage to the environment. So as we heard Sean just describe, there, there is the great potential for ash effects on nearby St. Lucia. All right. Um, so those of you who will be accessing this PowerPoint to, uh, presentation, there's a link here, control click to the toolkit and the Queensland government uh, of Australia pages. So when you access this uh, PowerPoint, make sure you click on those and there's a lot of good resources that you can access. Communications and systems for public information and warnings. Well, these days, do you know anybody that doesn't have a cell phone? Pretty much everybody these days has a cell phone. All right, and you get alerts. Everybody has some kind of news feed. Everybody has some kind of social media now. And that's one of the good things of the information age. The bad thing is that there's so many uh, misinformers, right? That is difficult sometimes to know what exactly is, is, the, is the truth and what isn't. We talked already about tsunami notifications throughout the Caribbean. They are, um, they are tied into the SMS warnings. We talked about evacuations. Evacuation warning, for example, a uh, couple of weeks ago and around Christmas into New Year's, the population of St. Vincent had evacuation warnings, which was, was a message that informs and enables individuals and communities to take appropriate action in response to the impending hazard. Right now in St. Vincent, we're seeing withdrawal. All right, we're seeing physical and coordinated movement of exposed persons the safer locations. The withdrawal requires careful, comprehensive, and coordinated planning. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, when you tell these people to move, where are they going to go? That's the main thing that had to be planned. How will they traverse? Which route will they take? Then they, when they get to where they're going, how are you going to manage the traffic? If people drove, where are they going to park? When they come out of cars, where are they going to go to? People who need transport, how is that going to be provided? What about additional security? All this has to be planned beforehand. Okay? Some community members and groups will require, assistant, uh, will require assisted withdrawal. For example, if there's a convalescent home or an orphanage, how are you going to move these people? So this a grid system ensures all people within affected communities are visited and facilitated. 
right, beforehand by the local disaster coordination center. So all this has to be pre-planned. Now let's also talk about return. If we have to return evacuees to their homes, we also have to plan that. So after this volcano dies down and goes back to sleep, goes back dormant, as is the case in Montserrat, a lot of people whose homes were untouched would be glad to go back home because, I mean, there's no place like home. Right? However, there was about 20% of uh, the population who found that where they were evacuated to was more amenable to their liking and decided to stay on. So in Montserrat, there was a problem now of what are we going to do with all these big empty houses? And it could be the problem in St. Vincent. We don't know. Time will tell. So the evacuation process does not end when the hazard has passed. It's critical that people return home in a safe manner with as much support and assistance as possible. Where return is not immediately possible, recovery services to facilitate short-term and longer-term temporary accommodation for displaced community members needs to be implemented. A live example of this is what happened in Barbuda following the hurricane. Uh, being a ward of the United Kingdom, the aid took a little while to get coordinated and to move across the Atlantic to the island of Barbuda. But once it got there, the United Kingdom Armed Forces took total charge of rebuilding the island. And from what I heard, it, the, the people of Barbuda were more than pleased with the rebuilding effort. So that's a, you know, that's a good news for them. That means it's great to be in Her Majesty's service. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Steele put a good smile on there because he's in Her Majesty's service. <laughs> Dr. Damien, um, with the uh -huh. remaining slides, do you want to uh, conclude this on another uh, session? Yes, we can. Because uh, oh, I think you, you have quite a few to already. go on there. Yeah. It's already 7.22, so maybe let's conclude this next week. I think it's very yeah, important, no very important based on what's happening right now. I think it's very mm -hmm. important. Uh, we may have more live examples from St. Vincent. I'm hoping not, but at least I could get some information from the response coordinators in St. Vincent. And um, I had mentioned in the first session that continuous learning from disasters is an important thread in, for any disaster management practitioner. All right? And it's not just from your own experiences, but from other people's experiences that we're going to learn. Yes, of course. So let's conclude. That we'll conclude on this next week. I think it's going to be beneficial especially to the Caribbean folks that uh, might be able to lend assistance. Um, when we had the last hurricane um, that hit Bahamas, we had coordinated uh, through AUGP and State of New York Chaplain Federation sending aid and food and stuff to, uh, to the Bahamas, which was a very extended effort. Um, nevertheless, I think, uh, it would be very important to conclude in uh, being able to provide more information, especially to the Caribbean people so who can lend efforts there. Yep. So, uh, Any questions so far? If anybody have questions, please raise your hands and I will let you come in there. Baby, baby, baby. Yes, honey. Can you come with us? 
Yeah, one second. Good yes, uh, yeah, we have a number of questions. Okay, so I'm gonna let Sean come back in because he's directly close by there, and then we'll let. Yes, uh, let me see. Him. Yes. Sean. Uh, good evening again. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, I think that's what I heard. Um, persons are uh, volunteering, or persons who volunteer in, in um, to take part in 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 um disaster management, that you need to take care of your situation first before you can actually um, go out and, and, and take care of the needs of others. Basically, I think that's what you said. Yes, um, that's, how, that's how most of the, the volunteers yes. I work with secure yeah. your house before you leave it. Um, why I bring up that point, um, for a number of years, I mean, you know that the islands are prone to hurricane each year. And a number of, for a number of years, being a police officer, most times when they have an impending weather system, um, a hurricane, they said, okay, leave a council for the police officers. So whether you're on vacation or you whatever you're on off, you know, your your off um, duty, you leave this council and they ask you to report into the nearest police station. And I always have an issue with that because I'm saying that. I leave in my home just before the hurricane hit to go to a police station and my family, you know, is on their own. And I say, I'm not going to the station. I always say, I'm not going. I'm going to mm -hmm. sit at my home, ride the storm out. And after the storm, I will secure my property, my family, and then I will go to assist others. And they have a problem with that because one year I actually went to the station and we all got wet in the police station because the rain came through the, 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 the roof and whatnot, whatnot, and my home was dry. So I was all wet all night and whatnot. I was worse than at the station. So from since then, I'm saying I'm not going to the station. I will remain home. And when everything is done, that storm have, have passed, I will assess my damages and whatnot, and then I will go to assist others. And, and the hierarchy of the police force have a problem with that. And and Luki was saying the right thing to do is for you to secure your home and and, and and you do what and then you go out. Yeah. So it's not only my belief, um, it's supported by a lot of people. Uh, you, when you go out to respond, you can indeed face a life-threatening situation. So you may end up dead as a responder. Every year responders die. And many countries never had a beneficiary fund set up for the families of these responders. All right. Um, but essential services by Commonwealth law in the Caribbean, um, essential services, they, I think, are undervalued and underappreciated. However, <laughs> as a volunteer, I, I'm not bound by the oath and the contract that uh, servicemen have, have signed, right? However, as a volunteer, I, if I call out my team, if I get the call out and I call out my team and they tell me they can't make it for whatever reason, I cannot force them. I can only ask. But we, some, some of my team are enlisted servicemen. So if they're called out, they have to respond. Um, in the other cases where those of us who serve in industry, if we don't have anything else pressing, then we can respond. Um, so while I may have, let's say, 30 people available, my response team may only be six at the moment. As other people secure their situation and make known their availability, the numbers may go up. But I agree with you in Trinidad too, is the same thing. They cancel leave for every serviceman and the problem, I think, is that servicemen are not prepared, they're not trained to prepare their families. So if, if you had prepped your home to a certain extent, it would be less of a hassle for you to depart your home to go to respond. You know, it's less of a, a, a mental burden, an emotional burden. But I know a lot, a lot of police officers and some firemen do not have disaster supplies 
in their house and they have never made their own personal plans and provisions. Simply a lack of the right knowledge. So, you know, that's one way that you could possibly look to bridge the gap, Sean, um, as, a, as an enlisted policeman. Uh, teaching your, uh, your, your comrades how to prepare their homes, how to disaster prep, so that at least, you know, the people at home know how to handle themselves and they have some supplies. All right, Damien, um, uh, I'd just like to take a few more questions while we're at it. I'm yeah. gonna let Vanessa let had her hand up first, then okay. Seth. Okay, so Vanessa, can you come in there with your question? Yes, I have two questions for Mr. Is it Damien, right? Yes, yeah. Damien. Uh, Damien, you made two, uh, um, you made uh, indications said, saying that about a volcano. When the volcano erupt and the lava has cooled down and the ash. What is what what happened uh, to the the location when the ash is there? And then you also made a a, um, a statement about you have to shade your beard. What's the purpose you have to shade your beard because when a volcano erupts? Or what's I mean? What's no, no, the no. I'm a responder. Okay. So if I have to respond, I have to wear an SCBA. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I have oh, to wear breathing it. apparatus. Okay. So this bed will, will cause leaks. Oh, okay. So inform me about the ash after the volcano has uh, erupted and everything. Okay, so you have the pyroclastic flow, which is the, you, you can find all this on YouTube, right? Right. Um, so right Dr. Volcano, Damien, let me just, uh, can I just interject for one second? Because of the time limit that we have so many rays of hands, we just keep it within um, that time so we can allow the other yeah. people's questions to go in and we can uh, touch more on this next week. Yeah, so just to quickly tell her, there's flowing lava, there's exploding lava, and then there's different densities of ash that will go up and it takes different time to come down. Oh, okay. All right, okay. You, can go, you can go check Mount St. Helens. I will, I will. Mount That's St. Helens was a great it, example. It's interesting. Thank you, yes. Vanessa. Thank I'm going to let Seth come in now. Yep. Seth, you're up. Hey, can anybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Um, thank you for this presentation, Brother Damien. I have you're many welcome. families, a lot of family in Trinidad. Um, and I was wondering, because of the turmoil all over the world right now, um, as far as... Uh, with hurricanes and especially volcanoes, what do you, what, is there any spiritual uh, rituals per se that we can do to, let's say, um, uh, prepare for, um, let's say, hurricanes, any kind of disasters in that area? I know in Caribbean islands, they, they do have spiritual rituals that they, that they have done throughout the, Throughout the, um, I guess, after the century, maybe. Let me. Not that I know of. I know when I'm ready to respond, we say a prayer. Well, as soon as I, I get up, I pray. As soon as I'm ready to go to sleep, I pray. Dr. Damien, okay. maybe I can interject a thought there. Now, you know, we're, we're most people are spiritual and believe in God. And I would say the, the best answer to that would be. We all pray when we have a, a, a disaster and you know, ask God to intervene. But in the same token, we also have to protect ourselves and our families. And we have to be cognizant of the dangers, the eminent danger that we face to protect ourselves, our families, the community, and do the right thing by yourself. Right. You know, allow God to do what God needs to do. But in the same token, you need to do what you need to do to keep yourself right. and your family safe. All right. right, thank you. I'm gonna bring in uh, Noble. Thank you very much, Seth. Peace and light, how are you guys doing today? Blessings. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering for those who uh, decide to continue on with the disaster management class, um, 
when when called upon to respond, is that going to be just in that specific area or is that internationally? You, you have to get involved, first of all, with your local disaster management group. Okay. Right? Um, that's where you're going to be of the most service. If right. you have special skills, right, or if you mm -hmm. are able to obtain special skills, and for example, like my company, we may need you, you know, uh, we may request that you come join us, it depends, you know, but we'll have to see your CV and we'll have to check your references and that kind of thing, if you're going to work with us. Um, right. But in your community, the training that we're offering is designed to serve your needs as a community member, as a family member, first and foremost, and in alignment with the chaplaincy, um, it's gonna, for example, if you lived in New York at the time of 9-11 and you had this kind of training back then, right. you would have brought so much help to the community. You know, you would have been like right. a pillar of resource in the community. So that, that's and the that's kind of thing that we're aiming at. Right, because that's uh, the, actually the first thing that popped into my mind was 9-11 uh, and the disaster that happened over there. You know, um, I figured everybody would be responding, you know, um, in, the, in a situation like that. But um, not everybody you see moving is responding. Some of right. them are just panicking. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me just interject some a thought, because, you know, I lived in New York through 9-11. And I will also tell you that uh, part of what we do in New York City, not, not just in New York, but in the United States, if you are formally trained as a chaplain to respond as a first responder and you have had the training, one of the things you can do after you receive your credentials, you can go into your local police precinct and show your credentials, your certificate that you've been trained as a chaplain and you would like to be able to assist the police whenever they have the need of a chaplain, let them know that you are alive that you are there, you're capable, ready, willing, and able to assist them and you know, give them your information. You cannot, it's not, not something that you can demand or force upon them, but the police right. is very open towards working with the community, especially people that's willing to do things like these. And mm -hmm. in some capacity, when they run into situations, they will call upon you to assist in those situations. Now, working with NYPD, it's a little different because uh, Dr. Olivencia is actually NYPD's chaplain liaison directly. He has an office at uh, One Police Plaza. So it's a little different because he interacts directly with uh, the head police in New York. So it's a little right. different there. And that can also happen within your area, but it's a matter of building a relationship with the police so they know they can trust you your team and what you do, and that you are capable of handling emergency situations and will not put yourself in harm's way in the middle of an emergency. But there's lots to cover on that, even though we've been through the chaplaincy training, you know, we are doing somewhat of a crash course that needs to go into deeper uh, training if someone really wants to take this up as a profession. All right. right. Yep. Thank you yep. for your question. I'm going to, uh, we had a, uh, Paul Tobit had a question. I'm going to bring him on. Hello, Paul. Hi, good night, everybody. I hope you're hearing me. Yes, sir. All right, first, I just want to say thank you very much to the facilitator, to the presenter, Dr. Damien. Um, you're welcome. I am former military, and I have had the opportunity to respond across the islands to several after hurricane events. So I can attest that what is being taught is quite relevant. It's quite factual. Um, so I just wanna say thank you very much for your training. I understand what you're saying. I've lived it. And let's continue and I just wanna be short. So thanks, that's it. Thank you very you're much, welcome. Paul. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, Shani had one more question. Let's just give her a moment to ask a question. 
Um, I don't have a question, but I didn't introduce myself correctly, but I'm a part of the Wish You To Moon Nation with Chief Tonic. Uh, okay, great. Um, I think it would be appropriate. I'm gonna allow Chief Tonic to come on for a moment just to say hello, because I know he is in St. Vincent right now. Yeah, I'm gonna be coming out there soon, so. Yes, I must say greetings, um, Damian. Yes, I love the lecture. You know what I mean? And you always add more to the table, Dr. Kalawu. I appreciate it. Big up, healing water. Big up yourself, all the other chief, Pastor Steels. You know, love light to you. Every other brothers and sisters on the platform. Well, it's a it's it's a wake up call for a lot of the people. But we gotta remember, it's nature. We are preparing to cleanse itself. This has been the work of nature, right? The volcano eruption, whatever it erupt now, I just give a little slight warning or whatever in the volcano itself. It has really basically to do with the restoring and the repairing of Mother Nature. So the most effective thing I would say to a lot of the people I'm here and in our system to help them in disaster management is to really locate the most vulnerable one that is in the most danger zone. And a lot of people don't take this into consideration when they are on the island in the most dangerous part, especially when it comes to disaster like a volcano. Because in the countryside, not too far from the volcano, there's a lot of populated people. So if the volcano was to give a serious eruption, it would affect this area like Spansy, Sandy Bay, Aura, okay? Like um, Chateau Bailey and these areas would be the most affected area. And these areas are highly populated. So people wasn't thinking into consideration of the danger zone they were in if at any time the volcano would erupt. Not to say that it would be a, a constant thing, but whenever it do, there is dangers that you're gonna be faced where you're gonna have to emergency evacuate and might never be able to return to that spot in particular. So this is one of the areas where we would have to touch them seriously in disaster management in letting the leaders or the politicians and them who survey and control certain district, villages, whatever, knows that in terms of disaster like hurricane or tsunami or whatever, the lowland area, the most effective area, is not good for house a housing project to be. And we have that as a main problem here in the island because most of the affected area is highly densely populated that is very close to the volcano. So this would be one of the major points we would have to stress on and situate that most people don't go back to certain location, even though they might find the land beautiful, nice, whatever. It's dangerous when come to this particular time. All right, Chief, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the update. We'll be touching base with you. I'm just mm -hmm. gonna bring on Pastor John from St. Lucia for a moment because he's also there with uh, brother uh, Alexander. Pastor John. Good night, Dr. Kiwi and Dr. Uh, Demian. I always enjoyed the presentation. I don't know, disaster management is one that is very close to my heart. And so I want to encourage you and good information, especially now, it is very handy. I greet everyone on this platform, my chiefs, um, in fact, everybody. I want to encourage us, we need to pray, pray for the, our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent, the tonic, Chief Tonic and all the members, the Vincentians, that it will be well with them. Keep up the good work, Dr. Kiwi. And I, I believe one of the beautiful things that have happened to Brother Sean is to be on this platform. And so we have three of them. I have Sean, I have Stephen, Stephen Cole, and Stephen um, Donnelly. But Brother Sean is excited about what is happening. And so to God be the glory, keep up the good work, my prayer with you all. Thank you, Pastor John. I'm just gonna invite Stephen to come on for a second. I know he hasn't, he's been on. Stephen, do you wanna just say hello? I'm sorry, Chief Governor, I, I'm listening. I'm with my, my child and my two-year-old. All right, that's all right. <laughs> Phenomenal class. Uh, being a first responder for the last 25 years, um, you guys are on point. 
And if I could help you guys out in any way, I'm definitely here for you guys. But uh, just a pleasure to be a part of the group. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. I know I saw the other Stephen a minute ago, but I'm looking at my screen to find him. Uh, where are you? Stephen Donnelly, there you go. Hello, Mr. Donnelly. Stephen Donnelly. Stephen, you're on. Hello? Or maybe I think it might be the uh, internet. Anyways, um, we have come to the conclusion of our class today. And we know that some things are happening in St. Vincent. We ask you to say a, a word of prayer on behalf of the island, the people there. Keep them in your prayers and your thoughts. I will also be discussing with Dr. Olivencia about um, uh, you know, our first responders um, possibly uh, responding to St. Vincent from New York. And we will touch base with the group out there shortly. So please be mindful of that. Thank you very much for being on tonight, everyone. We highly appreciate it. We know it's a great task for people to put their time and efforts into this. We appreciate that. We appreciate your, your love for humanity and the brethren and everyone uh, that gets involved in this training. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Steele. Can you come on for a moment? Don't hear you, Dr. Steele. Okay, is that better? Now we can hear you, yes. Pleasant, mm -hmm. good evening. Dr. Damien, um, well presented. And uh, it was a good presentation. Um, Tony, our prayers and our thoughts are with you. Um, I have others um, in St. Lucia as well, because you know I'm from Barbados, so it's close to our heart. And Barbados is also going to be responding to, to Lane's support. Um, one, one quick thing to just um, kind of strengthen, Dr. Damon, that you shared that is, is really interesting and very critical is that anytime that you're responding to a crisis, you have to be focused on what the crisis is and what are your um, abilities within those crises. Hurricanes, you can stay on ground, make your house strong volcanoes is different. So anytime you hear a crisis and you want to respond, always be mindful first of what type of crisis is it? And what are the restrictions and parameters within the crisis management? And how can you fit in? Because some crisis you run away from and prayer and other crisis you go and you see how you can lend your support. So Dr. Damien, I think that was very well presented this evening. Um, Dr. Kalu, um, a very good um, presentation this evening, and uh, uh, thank you so much to all the chiefs, um, John, and, and all those in the islands. We continue to keep you in our prayers and our thoughts. Um, good evening, Chief Akinaki and all of the other chiefs. Um, God's blessings. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Steele. I'm going to ask uh, Anita Davis to uh, dismiss us in a word of prayer. Yes, you're on now. Good evening to every everyone. Good evening to you. Um, I took this opportunity, although I was in your your last session, to join the join the class. That's okay. <laughs> so thank you for acknowledging me. If everyone could uh, bow their heads in a word of prayer. Thank you. Uh, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this moment in time. Thank you for bringing us all together and allowing us to grow in greater knowledge and greater wisdom. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless all the facilitators, all of those doers and builders and conveners that have come, that if they have come united in an effort to make this a better world. Thank you so much for all of the, the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Please help us to always walk in and 
in an attitude filled with gratitude for all of the, the, the blessings. Please pray for those that are facing strife right now. Uh, we know that you are a powerful healer and that you can change any situation in just a matter of moments. We, th we thank you, dear Lord, for bringing us together, for allowing us uh, to celebrate with each other our humanity, our ability to serve and to uplift one another. These and all of the blessings that you bring to us each and every day, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank, thank you, everyone. And uh, we will see you on Monday for our uh, next class. So thank you once again. Special good night to Dr. C. Still. <laughs> yes, How are you, Pastor Dr. Still? <laughs> yes, Pastor John. Yes. So everyone is unmuted there. Greetings to Dr. Still. Good, good evening, Pastor John. I love you so much, bro. How you yeah, doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I somehow <laughs> I forgot to mention your name. I, it's all good. It's all good. There are many of us. You are the spice. One of the spite of this platform. <laughs> Behave yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Damien, call me after. Sure, will do. Dr. Kiwi? Oh, yes, sir. I will give you a shout. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Good night, Dr. Kiwi and everyone. Thank you. Good night, Dr. Damien. Good, good, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good I'm night, Dr. Steele. Oh, That's my friend. Hold tight. Hold tight. Good night, guys. Red, red on this platform. Tonic, man. Thank you. Good night, Hi. everyone. Good night, everyone. Yes. Bless you. Good night to all on the platform. Peace and love, and love to you. Joseph. I'm like to my brothers and sisters. Good night. Good night. Take care, guys. Good night. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Steele, love light yes, to you. Yes, yes. Chicago Bears. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Peace and love. Peace and love, everybody. Peace and yeah, love. love. That's what it's all about. Peace and love to all the Chiefs. All the Chiefs and the platform. Peace and love. Peace and love to all the Chiefs. 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 Peace and love, family. Good night. All right. Good night to everyone. Yeah, love. Love. Hello, sir. Yeah, all praise. All the kids. Yeah. All right, sweetie. I'm perfect. All the blessed. You gotta go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Hello. Hello, baby. Hi. Hi. How are you? Yes. <laughs> well done. You're looking after daddy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Baby Waters is best. Good night. He was best. Forever. All right, everyone. <laughs> Blessings. Good night. Good night. Good night. All the best. Good night. Bye.